Hi gang, I'm going to show you how I make high voltage capacitors, the problems I've run into, and how I solve them. Here are some of the capacitors I've made. This one's a flat plate capacitor. It contains aluminum plates like these two inside it. And those I got from a local hobby store. It comes in packages like this. And I simply encased the whole thing in automotive resin. And then because it was built up in layers, I, want to, I was worried about leakage out the sides, so I encased the whole thing in paraffin wax. The wires I simply bought from a local electronics store. It's 14 gauge wire, but it's got nice thick insulation. This one is a cylindrical capacitor. The inner plate is a half inch copper cylinder made of this type of stuff. Uh, followed by the dielectric, which is several layers of this green polyethylene. And then the outer plate is a sheet of copper, which you can see right here. And then to encase it all, I have this piece of clear acrylic. And then I've also coated it in epoxy and put some plastic end pieces. I've already gone over the basics of making capacitors in my how to make low voltage capacitors video. Things like plate area, distance between the plates, capacitance, and dielectric constant. These things still apply to high voltage capacitors, so make sure you watch that video too. In that video I also talked a bit about breakdown voltage, or dielectric strength. But it causes problems more often with high voltage capacitors, so that's what I'll spend time on here. The capacitor is made up of two electrically conductive plates, separated by a non-conductive insulator, usually called a dielectric. When a capacitor is charged, electrons collect on one plate and depart from the other plate, leaving one plate with more electrons than protons, and the other plate with more protons than electrons. One plate now has a net negative charge, and the other has a net positive charge. The dielectric in between the plates is an insulator, and doesn't conduct electricity, but it can physically break down, or be damaged, and the spot where it breaks down can become conductive. When you buy a capacitor, the breakdown voltage is written on it. This doorknob capacitor has a breakdown voltage of 18 kilovolts. This one I got from a microwave oven. Its breakdown voltage is 2100 volts AC, and that's because it's used for as an AC capacitor in the microwave oven. And this big one right here is rated at 4000 volts DC. How do you choose the thickness for your dielectric? I sometimes use layers of this polyethylene as my dielectric. I got it from a carpet store. They use it under carpets to prevent any water in the carpet from going down into the floorboards. But how many layers should I use? The first thing you have to do is search online for the breakdown voltage or dielectric strength of the material you're planning on using. It'll give some value like so many volts per thickness. Often you'll find a range, for example 480 volts per mil to 551 volts per mil. Pick the lowest one to be safe. One mil is one thousandth of an inch. Let's say we want to be able to handle 20 kilovolts or 20,000 volts. 20,000 volts divided by 480 volts per mil gives us a thickness of 41.7 mil. That's 42 one thousandths of an inch. If I take my calipers, I find that a single thickness of polyethylene is 5 one thousandths of an inch. So 42 divided by 5 tells me that 8.4 layers of polyethylene will be thick enough to withstand 20,000 volts. Of course I'll round that up to 9 layers, or even more for additional safety. And so I made a polyethylene capacitor with nine layers to test the breakdown voltage. So here's a setup for testing the capacitor. I have a high voltage probe over here which is measuring the voltage from my homemade power supply. Over here I'm going to be measuring the uh, voltage itself. This is where I display it. Uh, the three here represents 30,000 volts. So this one here is 10,000 and this two is uh, 20,000 volts. And then I have an ammeter here to measure current if there's going to be enough. Let me just turn it on. Turn it up. And right now we're at 15,000 volts. 20,000. 25,000. And 30,000. That's the highest my power supply can go. And so I redid the tests, removing one layer at a time, until it finally broke down. Okay, I've removed eight layers, down to just one. And it makes you wonder where the voltage is being held. There we go, it busted. <laughs> down to one layer, and we can see the current is off the scale. You can hear it hissing now. So the voltage is down, way down. So let's open it up and see the damage. Now there we can see it. 
brown spot right there through the dielectric, brown spot on the middle there, and a dark spot right there as well. And I believe is a hole. Yep. As you can see, the calculations based on the online data were way off. It didn't break down until I got down to one layer, whereas the calculations said nine layers would be the minimum. But you also heard a lot of hissing. Here's a side-by-side -side test run. On the left, the lights are off, and you can see plenty of corona, or leaking electrons that are ionizing the air. That's the source of the hissing. So due to these leaks, the voltage may not have been as high at the capacitor as we thought. I'll redo the test with new capacitor plates later, after I've explained a bit more. Another thing that plays a part in determining the breakdown voltage is the shape of the capacitor, especially capacitors whose plates aren't flat. The thing that causes the dielectric to break down is the electric field between the plates. The electric field can be visualized as lines going between each corresponding charge on either plate. The more charge, the more densely packed the lines, meaning the stronger the electric field. And the stronger the electric field, the easier the dielectric will break down. But charges are packed more closely together at a sharp edge. Let's say you have a capacitor where one plate is a rod down the center of the second plate, which is a cylinder. In between is the dielectric. Near the cylinder, the electric field is weak since it's spread out. But near the rod, the electric field is stronger, and so there's a higher chance the dielectric will break down in that area. If you find that's a problem, then either use a dielectric with a higher breakdown voltage, or change the shape of your plates. For example, increase the diameter of your rod. Of course, that means the distance between the rod and the cylinder would decrease, so increase the diameter of your cylinder too. Another issue with high voltage capacitors is leakage to the surrounding air at sharp edges. I've already shown you this leakage here with my capacitor plates made of thin aluminum flashing. These strong electric fields at the sharp edges leaked in the form of ionized air, or corona. This other leakage was due to sharp points on the ends of two stranded wires, where they were twisted together. Here's a normal plate capacitor with the electric field lines drawn in. Note that they're denser at the edges of the plates. One problem here is increased breakdown voltage in the dielectric, but the same applies to the surrounding air. The electric field there may be strong enough to ionize that surrounding air. You have a leak, and with the electrons leaking away, the voltage will drop. It'll be like trying to keep the water pressure up with a leaky hose. If you do have a problem, then one solution is to make the edges more rounded. Notice that the electric field lines at the edges are no longer as dense. You can do that a little with aluminum foil, like we do with lifters, for example. It's done by folding the edge around something and over onto itself, like you see here. But often I just use thicker aluminum or copper plates instead, which I buy from hobby shops. I cut the corners round and use fine sandpaper to smooth out the sharp edges. An added step is to insulate the plates. I usually start by putting on a few layers of Corona Dope, which is especially made for this purpose, and which you can get from electronic stores, possibly even Radio Shack. Then I sometimes also coat them in epoxy, or a resin, or wax. One source of resin is automotive stores, since it's used with fiberglass to repair damage to car bodies. I get this wax from grocery stores, where it's used for canning, and this one from art stores, where it's used for making candles. For the wax, I heat it up on the stove, and then pour it over the capacitor. Sometimes I need to make a mold for this. If you keep the wax just above the temperature at which it melts, you can use aluminum tape to hold your mold together. But do some tests first. There are some things to look out for when using resin. If you pour your resin on too thick and it's a quick hardening resin, then it may harden in a curved shape and bend your plates out of shape, like these ones I took out of one capacitor I built. So long hardening time is better. However, the resin I get from automotive stores hardens very fast, a half hour or so. The solution there is to do it in multiple thinner layers. Another way to insulate capacitors is to put them in mineral oil. I've never done it for my homemade capacitors, but it's done here in this high voltage power supply. For the high voltage capacitors on this Cockroft Walton voltage multiplier board. So I'm ready to redo the breakdown test. Here are the finished thicker plates with rounded and sanded edges and insulated with three layers of Corona Dope. I've also made a little custom way of connecting the feed wires so that there's less leakage there too. I'll put a link in the description to the video to a page on my website where I show how I make these custom connectors. But really, any rounded and insulated connectors you can find will do. I've also added these two resistors in series for a total of 240 kilo ohms. They're so that when it does break down, the current won't damage my power supply, and the electromagnetic wave, or whatever caused that so-called lens flare on my camera, won't damage my camera. The higher current breakdown would have been due to the better insulated capacitor plates having more charge just before the breakdown. And now for the breakdown test. Let's turn it on. Fifteen thousand volts, twenty thousand, thirty thousand volts. So even with smooth edged plates, the breakdown didn't happen until I had just one layer. Time for a test using a more standard test capacitor, just to make sure I'm doing things right. A more standard way to do these breakdown tests is with a uh, plate like this, 
and a smaller plate like that and your dielectric in between and with this plate with a particular roundness to the edge right here and eight removed one to go last one there we go that did it <laughs> and that confirms that my other tests were valid uh, this polyethylene has a much higher breakdown voltage than the documented one online. And so ends my brain dump on making high voltage capacitors. I hope it helps, or at least you found it interesting. And thanks for watching. Check out my YouTube channel, RimStar.org, for more videos like this. That includes a video I mentioned on how to make low voltage capacitors, another where I again show my power supply, high voltage probe and amp meter while doing airflow tests with smoke for my lifter, and for variety, one on how to make a jewel thief for zombie batteries. And don't forget to subscribe if you like these videos, or give a thumbs up, or leave a question or comment below. See you in a bit.